and welcome back to the second half of the lecture where we talk about some of the first people to actually see and explore Antarctica. And this is this focuses on the earliest sightings of Antarctica before the so called heroic age before we get to some of the more famous Antarctic stories that actually involved much more venturing into the interior of Antarctica itself. Now, before I continue on to that, I want to mention a couple of things related to class assignments. So lecture quiz two will occur next week and there will be a review session for it on Monday, May 17th. And make sure to do lab six on glaciers. In the review session that I held today, I touch a little bit on the connections between last week's lectures on glaciers and this week's lab on glaciers. I also encourage you to get a head start on reading assignment number two, and that assignment should only take an hour or two at most, so it's something you can knock out if you'd like to get ahead on work. It's not due until May 30th, however. I also want to mention that there are two UC Santa Cruz seminars, one on um, one on Tuesday, May 11th at 3.30, where um, a researcher from UT Austin will talk about how the water and carbon cycles are related to related to fractures in bedrock how basically how water and water and carbon cycle through that and on friday may 14th at 12 noon um, a researcher from purdue university will talk about how celestial bodies like asteroids are eroded or broken down we also have a colloquium happening in our department on thursday uh, may 13th at 2 p.m we'll have a researcher talking about earthquakes um, and the connection between earthquakes and rock type, among other topics. So all three of those talks are potential extra credit opportunities if you would like to try to improve your midterm score or if you'd like to give yourself any measure of um, measure of extra points for later or if you just possibly want to get a little bit more involved with some of the geology research that our department is involved in. Ginger beer, just FYI. But anyhow, the Zoom links and the full descriptions for each of the two events are in the May 10th update under instructor announcements on Gaucho Space. So you can find the links to the UC Santa Cruz seminars there. The link to the UCSB colloquium is visible in here, but it's also linked on the announcement. Um, regarding assignment number two, it's very similarly formatted to the first assignment. It's about a 400 page write up, but it is about a it is about an academic journal journal article this time. It's a it's an, it's about writing about something that is research that was written by the scientists or possibly the historians or social scientists themselves. And one that has been peer reviewed, meaning that people from the author's field who were not directly involved in the project have looked over the write up have looked over over the journal article for potential scientific errors or conflicts of interest or inaccuracies. And again, I'm open to you. I'm open to you picking what interests you. And one thing I suggest is using a database on the UCSB library system. Um, you can access those when you are logged in with your UCSB credentials. And if you're interested in geology, you can use GeoRef and look for geology articles about Antarctica. If you're interested in biology, you can use one of the biology databases and search for articles about penguins or tardigrades or Antarctic ice fish or whatnot. Or if you're interested in Antarctic history, you can use a history database and search for articles about Shackleton or about Captain Cook's voyage or about women explorers in Antarctica or whatever interests you. Um, and I'm happy to look over articles to indicate whether I think it's a good fit, and I'm happy to suggest articles as well. For your response, you need to make sure that you address what the author's research goals were, so make sure that you don't pick something that's just a review of other people's research, because that will make it hard to answer this question. And you want to talk about what the author's results were and why their results are important. Hopefully the authors indicate somewhere why their research matters even if it's just something that matters in the context of whatever field the authors are working in. And lastly, you need to address if the results were what the authors were, if it's what the authors were expecting. Somewhere they should indicate some sort of prediction they have for their research. And in their discussion, they should indicate whether what they actually found when making their study 
was what they expected. So let me know if you have questions about reading assignment number two. In the meantime, we continue on to a world that looks much more like how we know the world to look today. But notice that this map made in the wake of Cook's voyages entirely lacks Antarctica. You can see Australia and New Zealand are more or less have the correct proportions now, but this just shows an empty Southern Ocean. And Antarctica is just missing here. Captain Cook had come away with the conclusion that there was only ice at the South Pole and not land. And so the depictions of Terra Incognita Australis disappeared from maps. But people continued venturing into the Southern Oceans and the speculation that there might maybe be land closer to the pole continued to bring people south. And it wasn't too long before people did realize that there was, in fact, an entire southern continent there. And the first person to see Antarctica was this gentleman with this wonderfully, um, wonderfully long name, Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen. And he was an officer in the Russian Navy. Um, the Tsar, or the Emperor of Russia, saw a chance to show Russia's greatness to the world and to compete with the Western European powers by sending an expedition to the Southern Ocean to potentially succeed in finding land where England and other Western European powers had failed. And Bellingshausen, you, as you can see on this excerpt from that map, he actually followed Cook's route pretty closely. He in fact actually met with Joseph Banks, who was a naturalist who had gone on Cook's first voyage and he received various books and other information from him to plan a trip into the Southern Ocean. And Bellingshausen was able to go just far south enough. Um, he got close enough to Enderby Land, which I briefly mentioned before. It's where the oldest rocks in Antarctica are found and it's about due south of Africa. But, excuse me. So he was able to see that there was in fact land there. He wasn't able to land. Um, he, but he was able to spot land in three different places. And he confirmed that there was actually a continent and not just scattered islands to the south. And the trip was largely considered to be a success because of this. He found some, he found a lot of islands like Peter the First Island and various other sub-Antarctic islands. Peter the First Island is significant because it was the farthest south land spotted at the time. Farthest south is something you'll see because people would eventually reach the South Pole. Um, there would be incremental discoveries of land further and further south until anybody actually did make the trek inland to reach the South Pole. So Bellingshausen and his crew reached a new farthest south and only three people died. So it was largely considered to be a pretty safe, successful voyage. But by the time Bellingshausen had returned to Russia, he got some unwelcome news. And that was that after he had seen it, but before getting back um, to other ships, commanded by Nathaniel Palmer of the US and Edwards Bransfield of the UK also had seen land and reported it. And the Tsar felt that his thunder had been stolen and that Russia's thunder had been stolen. So he declined to fund another exped expedition. But people would start to venture south. And one of those was Mr. Nathaniel Palmer, who I mentioned briefly on the last slide. And he is a good example of somebody who was in Antarctica for economic reasons and not for scientific reasons so much. He was a seal hunter and his employer sent him to the Southern Ocean so that he could find safe harbors for sealing. He would find one on what is now known as Deception Island because it appears to be sheer cliffs from the outside, but it is a caldera or a collapsed volcano. And it is actually one of the safest um, it's actually one of the safest harbors in the sub-Antarctic islands. It also still has some geothermal warmth, so there are actually hot springs around here because the volcano is not completely dead. Fun fact, Deception Island is formed from a hotspot just like Mount Erebus. It's quite far from, it's quite far from the plate boundaries themselves. Um, Palmer would first establish the base at Deception Harbor, and then he would continue on and happen to see the Antarctic mainland during his southerly visits. He also discovered the South Orkney Islands, which are another sub-Antarctic chain that are much closer to the mainland. He is recorded as having expressed little to no interest in them or in the mainland because he couldn't find any abundant seals there. He didn't really have many scientific ambitions. He was mostly interested in finding seals. It's a bit ironic to me because of this that 
one of the US's research bases is named after him. Um, it's the one in the Antarctic Peninsula, which for a long time the United States referred to as the Palmer Peninsula. That's been abandoned to sort of establish more of the Antarctica as neutral idea, which we'll talk more about in, um, it'll be lecture 17 later in the course. Now, sealing and whaling were the main economic activity in the Southern Ocean for a long time. After Deception Island was discovered, along with other islands with safe harbors, um, like those on South Georgia, whale and seal hunters began to establish sealing and whaling stations in Antarctica. So by the late 19th century, South Georgia, Deception Island, and the other subantarctic islands were dotted with various sealing and whaling colonies. They had sort of sprung up overnight. They were very ramshackle, cheaply put together places where the only people living there were the men employed by the companies to hunt the seals and whales and to process their carcasses and send them back to um, the United States or Europe for whatever they were going to be used for. Whales were used for oil. Uh, whales, whale, whales were harvested mainly for their oil. Seals for their fur. Um, these colonies kind of had a Wild West feel to them. They were chaotic, very few women lived in them, and they were famous for brawling and drunkenness and other just other bad behavior. Um, the largest one was Gritviken, which um, is in South Georgia, and it still survives today. It can be visited by cruise ships. Um, now, the Antarctic fur seals were hunted for their warm pelts, and they those were popular among rich people in the US and Europe. Even though they did sell the whales for meat also, the main reason they went after the whales was to get whale oil, which was used to light lamps in cities before electricity went into widespread use. And whalers and sealers did play a role in exploring more of the Antarctic, but they often didn't report the new land they found, often because especially if there was a seal or whale population nearby, they wouldn't want anybody to know that their, this great sealing and whaling ground was there. So they often just wouldn't report their discoveries. Remember that the reason that Palmer even reported the fact that he found the South Orkney Islands as well as the mainland was because there weren't any seals nearby. So he didn't really care about hiding those discoveries from his, com from his competitors. Sealing and whaling took a massive toll on the Antarctic ecosystem. The seals seemed so abundant that they would just be recklessly slaughtered and just sometimes they would kill ones they didn't even need to. In 1800 alone, just in a single year, 57,000 seals were reported to have been slaughtered for skins to be taken. So that's the population of, that's the population of like a mid-sized United States city. That's a horrifying number of seals. And sealing hunted, sealing brought the Antarctic fur seal to near extinction. They have, their population would later recover in the 20th century, after which, um, during which many of the subantarctic islands were declared to be part of um, part of a nature reserve. Um, but their population has not quite reached their pre-sealing abundance. And whaling was very devastating to whale populations because baleen whales, like humpbacked whales and the blue whale, live very long lives and only have a few offspring and don't reproduce very often. So if you slaughter them, they don't, their population doesn't come back very quickly. And this is exactly what happened with baleen whales in the Southern Ocean. Even though whale populations have recovered somewhat, they have also not reached their reported pre-hunting abundance. And now the sealing and whaling colonies are empty um, because Eventually what happened is that by the time the nature reserve was established in the early 20th century, there were barely any seals left, barely any whales left. Both had been hunted to near extinction and it wasn't economical to even, um, to even hunt them anymore. Part of the reason the nature reserve was even established was to possibly help reestablish the populations. And they have been, but people have since decided it's wiser to largely just not hunt in the Antarctic to not risk completely wiping out either baleen whales or seals. And so the sealing and whaling colonies are now abandoned and empty. Um, and nobody lives on the subantarctic islands except for a few researchers at bases and the people on the Falkland Islands, which are um, their own territory. And 
So that's one thing to consider in terms of how, in terms of the human impact on Antarctica and on its ecosystem. Antarctica, its ecosystem existed in isolation from humanity for a very long time. But when humans showed up, they showed that it's possible for, for one species to dramatically change the ecosystem in a pretty short amount of time. And this would later be a big reason why the Antarctic Treaty was drawn up out of concern for humanity's potential impact on Antarctica. Now, I've mentioned that most of the sealers and whalers weren't really there to do science. One interesting exception was James Waddell, who the Waddell Sea is named after. And his job was sealing, but he was actually somebody who became a sealer out of an interest in science and in exploration. And he went on three separate voyages that were nominally to find sealing grounds, but he went farther south than he had to and took extensive scientific notes. On the second voyage, he found the South Orkneys, unaware that Palmer had found them. And on his third voyage, he ventured south from the Orkney Islands into the sea east of the Antarctic Peninsula, the Waddell Sea, that was later named after him. And he reached a new farthest south, but he decided to not continue further. Um, as you can see, the red line stops in the middle of the Waddell Sea because he decided that there must not be land in that part of Antarctica. Um, if he had gone two more days, he would have reached Coates Land and figured out that he was indeed in a relatively small sea and not in a vast expanse of water at the South Pole. Um, but he incorrectly came to the conclusion that the water went all the way to the South Pole and that there wasn't that much land in that part of Antarctica. It would take a long time for the coastline to be fully mapped and for people to realize just how large Antarctica was. Um, another, ex another expedition during its time was the first French Antarctic expedition conducted, um, led by Jules Dumont d'Urville. And this was commissioned specifically for science, um, mainly to look for the magnetic South Pole. So during a trip from 1837 to 1840, Dumont and his men measured, um, excuse me, they mapped much of the Eastern Antarctic Peninsula and a large portion of East Antarctica that lies south of Australia. And it was important that Antarctica's coastline be mapped to give anyone a sense of just how large the continent was and what was actually there. And they did not reach the South Magnetic Pole. Using their compasses, they determined that the South Magnetic Pole must be on land because they couldn't reach it on their ships. Um, it was indeed located in what is now known as Adelie Land at the time. And they, um, he was forced to abandon any hope of possibly landing on Antarctica and reaching the South Magnetic Pole because a bunch of his men got scurvy and were demanding that they return to New Zealand. So they managed to locate the Magnetic South Pole but didn't manage to reach it. Um, and the trip also involved naming and discovering a number of species of marine flora and fauna. And that gave scientists a sense of just how much interesting wildlife there was in the oceans in Antarctica, especially deep down. His crew took some of the first samples of benthic or sea dwelling or seafloor dwelling marine flora, excuse me, marine fauna like the sponges and sea, and, and sea stars and giant sea spiders that we saw in the biology unit. The first American expedition that was specifically put together for science um, actually involved a leg that was a trip to Antarctica. And in the 19th century, the United States was very much a country that was trying to prove itself to the Western European powers. Science became one front on which the American government was seeking to compete with Europe. And so the first American expedition specifically put together was the United States Exploration Expedition, which is usually just known as the Wilkes Expedition, um, named after Captain Charles Wilkes, the man who commanded it. And this was actually funded by Congress. It was some of the first science funded by the government, by, by the United States government. Um, and part of the reason that Congress authorized it was out of the desire to make the United States look grand and make it look like the United States had the footing to compete with Europe. But there were also whaling companies and sealing companies that were based in New England whose hunting grounds had been depleted by this time, by the mid 19th century. And they wanted Congress to fund efforts to find more whaling and sealing grounds farther south. So there was an economic incentive involved in this trip as well. The sealers and whalers hoped that the expedition would 
find more places to build hunting stations as well as more islands that had a lot of seals living on them and whales living around them. So two of the ships involved in the expedition went to Antarctica and over the course of the expedition, the men mapped a lot more of the continent and came back with a large number of plant and animal specimens, both from Antarctica as well as from the Pacific Islands themselves. They would also, um, many of those samples actually ended up in what is now the Smithsonian. Um, so there are quite a few samples from the Southern Ocean in the Smithsonian collection actually. And they did indeed report new places to build whaling and sealing stations. And indeed the whaling and sealing companies moved south and depleted the whale and seal populations on the Southern, on the southern islands as well. So sealing and whaling moved south. The expedition was also infamous for a number of violent events with the indigenous peoples of the Pacific islands. And Charles Wilkes actually got court-martialed for massacring um, at least 80 people on the island of Malolo, which is now part of Fiji. So if the US government was gonna court martial him on this, that means he screwed up big time. So that did not exactly help PR for the US. And you can see that they, you can see how close they got to Antarctica. They reached Antarctica, uh, they, got, they got to Antarctica by heading south from New Zealand. They did not land on the shore itself. They landed on an iceberg that was just a few miles offshore. Um, we will not actually get to the first physical landing in Antarctica until the next lecture. The last expedition that we'll talk about prior to the heroic age is that of James Clark Ross, whose name you will see come up quite a bit in the geographic features like Ross Island, as well as the confusingly named James Ross Island, which is on the opposite side of the continent, but the Ross Sea as well. Um, and many of these are named after him because he was the first to spot them. He was the first piece of person to, he was the first person to sail into the Ross Sea and into McMurdo Sound, which is the relatively shallow part of the sea around Ross Island where McMurdo base is now. So he sailed from 1839 to 1843 and his vessel was an example of a strengthened vessel that could withstand the ice better than a, a simple wooden ship could. It was a bomb vessel in which the warship, um, it was a warship that had a strengthened hull that was designed to withstand the recoil from the release of mortar weapons. So it was meant to, it was meant to withstand as bombs were shooting out of the ship. And James Ross correctly hypothesized that strengthening the hull, that having a ship that had the hull strengthened this way would be able to handle the ice decently. So he was able to ship to sail these ships into the ice and he would map the Ross Sea as well as much of Ross Island. And he also spotted Mount Erebus, which was erupting at the time. So he discovered the first volcanoes in Antarctica. Um, he spotted the Antar he spotted Victoria Land as well as the Transantarctic Mountains rising above Victoria Land. He didn't land on the continent itself, um, but he reached a new farthest south in the process of sailing into the Ross Sea and was the first to map and explore an area that would later become pivotal to Antarctic history. Um, Ross Island would be a starting point for the later races to the South Pole. And it's also where the largest settlement on Antarctica, um, McMurdo Base, is built today. The Ross expedition was one of the last large British expeditions for a long time. Um, in part because well, his expedition came back with a lot of really great observations and tales of wonderful things like volcanoes and ice, it didn't necessarily come back with much evidence that there was a lot of money in the government sending more ships there. It didn't really seem like it was possible to find minerals or much in the way of stuff that would make the government money. So there would be relatively few further expeditions, both by the British, but in general by anybody until the heroic age later in the 19th century. Um, the heroic age would involve a concentrated period of exploration in which many more of the expeditions had a, had a focus on exploration specifically and on finding new land specifically, as opposed to possibly that being a side product of a voyage that was intended more for economic purposes. So in the next lecture, I will talk about 
the exploration in the later 19th century that constitutes the, the heroic age, excuse me. And that will involve the first people to actually set foot in Antarctica. So you all have a good week. I will see you on Wednesday um, for the next lecture and have a good night. <laughs>